uh, welcome to this uh, interesting lecture meeting on gst audit a curtain raiser the learned faculty is on his way he's a bit delayed in traffic but we can start a little bit of preliminaries and uh, he'll join us in uh, maybe the next few minutes uh, at bcs we would like to start the events in time so maybe we can just do a little bit of preliminaries uh, and he'll be here in some time uh, gst audit of course is yeah so the uh, faculty is here uh, so he'll just join us in a minute uh, gst of course as we are aware is one of the biggest uh, tax reforms which we've seen in the last uh, decade or even more than that uh, of course by itself it has brought in many opportunities for all of us as professionals both in terms of implementation training and compliance related assignments all that phase is now more or less stabilized we are now moving towards the first ever gst audit and the due date for that under the statutory provisions which are section 35 is fast approaching as of today the due date appears to be 31st of december having said that the format for gst audit is still not out though yesterday we had a format which was announced for the gst annual return and uh, when one goes one goes through the gst annual return format perhaps to a large extent it uh, revalidates the thought process that yes the government really has an intention to uncomplicate things uh, the format if uh, we had a uh, occasion to glance through it is uh, a reasonably simplistic format of course in each uh, of the documents there will always be a few uh, opportunities and flip sides to it but primarily if you look at it it uh, attempts to consolidate your gst returns which have been actually filed of course within two parts the first is the returns filed for the financial year which basically means from your july 17 to uh, march 18 we have the pleasure of parin welcome parin uh, with your consent in your absence we thought we'll just start the ball rolling uh, welcome uh, uh, on the dais so uh, we were just talking about the gst annual return and we just said that uh, just to set the ball rolling we'll talk about the gst annual return wherein there is a consolidation of the monthly returns which are being filed in two baskets which is for the financial year and the uh, amendments and rectifications which are carried out in the next period and of course thereafter uh, there is a little bit of an open endedness in terms of the calculations of the liability they of course are clearly highlighting that any credits which are not claimed till september will lapse which therefore casts a lot of onus on the organizations to make sure that the september return is done in the right manner i'm sure parin would touch a little bit about the importance of the september return in the uh, duration of his talk coming to the gst audit format uh, the government uh, invited uh, draft uh, formats from various organizations and we already have two uh, draft uh, recommended formats by the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India as well as the Bombay Chartered Accountants Society have independently sent two draft formats to the government. Both the formats are in the public domain. Both of them uh, have a different uh, flavor to it. Both of them have their merits and demerits. And since the government's uh, format is still not out, maybe uh, Parin will touch upon a little bit of uh, the macro level nuances of the two formats and uh, on the broad philosophy of how it's likely to head. GST audit, of course, uh, uh, is a work in progress with a little bit from the government side pending. And it's in that regard that we felt that there are two ways of approaching this issue. Either we could delay a uh, discussion on that topic till the time it receives a ultimate finality or at least start some preparatory activities. And we felt that it's important to start the preparatory activities because once the format is announced, there would be a deluge of activities around all of us. And at that time, maybe the time would be really short to really understand the mammoth task of GST audit and implement it across our clients. So uh, we thought of having a curtain raiser event of this nature, wherein we can understand irrespective of the format in which the GST audit report is prescribed. What are the key aspects which one as a professional will have to look at? Lots of questions come to our mind. What exactly is the scope of a GST audit? Is the auditor expected to be an assessing authority or is he expected to be a facilitator in an assessment? 
what how should the auditor proceed to ensure a reconciliation especially considering the challenge that it's a mid year implementation of gst and also considering the fact that here we do not have a revision of gst returns requiring adjustments through subsequent uh, returns and rectifications and amendments therein what are the processes which need to be followed to ensure that we are in a state of preparedness on this front what are the things which the client needs to do at his end what are the key formats and what are the key features and the distinguishing factors of those and more importantly we had a audit under the vat regime and uh, as auditors we have handled vat audits so what are the experiences from those vat audits what are the learnings from them and how i i is the gst audit different from the vat audits which we performed in the erstwhile regime to address all of this we thought that we wanted somebody from a vat domain and that's where we have with us parin parin of course is a very very dear friend of bcs a uh, very active committee member uh, everyone over here knows him very well uh, part of kpmg uh, coming from a legacy of uh, indirect tax practice from his uh, father's uh, generation so really a second generation and it's uh, the indirect tax flows from his genes i would believe uh, i generally always talk about him as a little master and that what exactly is he is uh, don't go by his size uh, his depth of knowledge is enormous and uh, whenever we look at anything which has indirect tax accounting and a combination of vat and service tax i think we couldn't find a better person than uh, parind to address those types of things so uh, parind we welcome you to this forum and uh, we look forward to a very interesting discussion on this uh, entire aspect from you uh, I, before i really request parind to take the session uh, i would uh, request suhas treasurer to present a memento to parind as a mark of our love and affection there is uh, one more uh, pleasant task to perform at uh, the indirect tax committee we felt that there was a need for having a series of short publications on the topic of indirect taxes especially gst rather than going coming out with a very detailed elaborate publication which keeps on uh, the, the law itself keeps on getting amended we felt that short monograph series is something which is the way forward we already released one uh, such publication a couple of months back which was on anti profiteering today we have the pleasure of releasing a second publication which is on exports which is written by chirag mehta i will request the chairman of the indirect tax committee deepak shah to kindly introduce the book and uh, say a few words about it good evening friends uh, as uh, sunil already mentioned that this is our second publication a uh, short publication uh, first one was anti profiteering and those who have not yet collected uh, or uh, bought their copies can do so uh, because there were limited copies uh, we had printed uh, the third publication is also in the pipeline so which we will be releasing in next uh, month or so uh, coming to this uh, today's uh, release uh, of booklet that is exports and export refunds friends even after one year of gst the most dissatisfied class would be exporters on one hand government wants to promote exports and that to be competitive uh, they have also allowed input of all taxes for exporters however uh, at the same time there are many safeguards and restrictions they have imposed in claiming the legitimate refund dues so practically it is found that this very safeguards intended to avoid abuse become bottlenecks denying the rightful benefit furthermore refund issues get compounded due to system related challenges and exporters started facing major working capital issues despite repeated export refund camps exporters still face dilemma on how to handle exports and to claim refunds the business and the professionals are struggling to understand the procedure and get the refunds on time and the common reply from the department is that the applications are not being filed properly and even proper documents are not attached with this in mind the committee therefore thought that it is a need of the hour to have a short publication which can explain in simple language uh, about the export procedures and refunds 
uh, at committee, uh, we thought of publishing this and Chirag Mehta, who is a committee member, immediately took up this opportunity and responsibility of compiling this book. Uh, we are thankful to Chirag for agreeing to do this. This is his maiden effort in publishing, in writing this book. Uh, we would also like to thank Sushil Solanki ji, who has meticulously waited this publication. And today he could not come, but in his uh, absence, we also thank him for his great contribution. Uh, friends, this book comprehensively covers all provisions of exports under GST law, export refunds under GST, and other procedural aspects relating to exports. Uh, it would be very interesting uh, publication to read. Uh, with this few words, I would now request Parin to release the book. Chirak, please. I will present one to the speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Over to Parind for a very interesting session. Problem is not going to be connect. Thank you, Sunil. Um. Okay. So, good evening, friends. Thank you for being here. This is the season of audits, so I can quite understand that we are all looking at doing different kinds of audit and adding to the kitty. But I'm not very sure whether this is the kind of audit we are all going to be happy doing or getting done. Well, so far as indirect tax is concerned, audits are not really new. 
we have been going through different kinds of audits and of course the first time audit was introduced under the indirect tax law was under the vat laws when we went in into that regime in 2005 2006 we have been grappling with those kind of audits every state prescribes their own law uh, sorry their own draft we had certain states which had very elaborate provisions in terms of audits and the requirements to be reported maharashtra being one of them gujarat being the other and there were some few other states which were very simple went to the extent of saying as more of a covering letter to say we attach you with the copy of the income tax audit report and that was really the audit report which was required to be filed uh, for the purposes of the VAT law. When we go, go into GST of course, we are expecting this audit to be much more elaborate, the requirements being onerous. But the whole question which really comes to our mind is that what is the focus of the audit? What is the purpose for which we need to undertake this audit? And of course, we look at the provisions, we look at what are the drafts which have been recommended and there is a little bit of a question which arises in our minds to say what is the expectation of the government from an auditor what is what do are we expected to report to what is what to what extent do they want us to really go into the books do an analysis or even go and uh, do an in-depth study of the business of the oddity and give certain answers or report certain findings in the audit report what we are going to do in the next about maybe 60 to 70 minutes We'll just quickly go through the criteria, some formats. We have two formats as uh, Sunil mentioned, challenges which we may face as auditors when we go into the uh, GST audit regime, what could be the approach and of course, how do we ask our clients to start preparing for the audit. Let's look at the criteria first. And I think that's quite simple uh, to begin with. The law provides that we have to file our audit report by the 30, sorry, we have to file our annual return by the 31st of December. Of course, the annual return has just been prescribed yesterday. We have the wonderful format which has come through uh, in the notification number 32. And fortunately, it doesn't seem to be so complicated. Barring maybe two or three areas where there seems to be some overlap or there seems to be a lack of clarity what they really want us to report. But more, more or less, I think that's a format. Fortunately, I, I would say which can be filled in. So it should not really <laughs> create so much of a difficulty. Of course, the law prescribes and there are two or, three, two or three provisions which will be looked at. The, this provision for filing the annual, report, annual return is prescribed under section 44 into, bracket, uh, 44 into bracket 1. The section further goes and says that in addition to the filing of the annual return, the uh, assessee is required to file an audit report along, along with reconciliations. So there is an expectation that there will be an annual return. Along with that, there will be an audit report and there will be a reconciliation to be filed as well. Now, the provisions for audit are, are enshrined under section 35.5 and that particular provision says that in respect of any registered person whose turnover exceeds the prescribed limit, which is 2 crores in our case, shall file, uh, shall get his accounts audited and shall fi file an audit report along with the reconciliation. It further goes on to say the reconciliation between the audited accounts and the returns which have been filed. I'm just highlighting these words because that is going to give us an indication of what is what should be the focus of the audit when the audit report is prescribed. Since we don't have an audit report, we still have to just make some guesstimates and some, uh, uh, I would say, guesses to say what does the law require the authorities to prescribe? What will be the prescription of the audit report which, which we will finally get? So as I was uh, saying, just to repeat, it talks about getting the books of accounts audited, filing the annual report, uh, annual audit report, and also filing a reconciliation between the audit uh, sorry between the audited financial accounts and the returns which have been filed so this is the purpose of the whole audit so far as the threshold limit is concerned i have said that it is 2 uh, 2 crores and here the question which has arisen and which has arisen in the minds of everyone is that how do i really determine my 2 crores is it an aggregate turnover which is to be considered as 2 crores on an all india basis or do we have to look at a, th a threshold limit of 2 crores per state? So, for example, if you are having a turnover of 5 crores in Maharashtra, but a turnover of only 50 lakh rupees in Gujarat, do you need to get your audits, uh, accounts audited? Or do you need to cross the threshold limit of 2 crores independently in every state? Now, that's where we have a little bit of a challenge and that's the first question which I'd like to address. Section 35.5 speaks about every registered person whose turnover exceeds a prescribed limit now it only refers to the word turnover 
when you look into the uh, definition section section 2 there is a definition of aggregate turnover and aggregate turnover is a turnover all over the uh, country in aggregation there is a definition of turnover in the state which is the turnover in the respective state but there is no definition of turnover however when you really look at this these two definitions i think the appropriate way to uh, interpret this will be to apply the definition of turnover in the state in the absence of any other uh, 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 direction because obviously aggregate turnover is a very precise definition which has been introduced and therefore it may not be appropriate to uh, apply the definition of aggregate turnover simpliciter to the word turnover and therefore the turnover should be turnover qua the state only and therefore my interpretation here is that you have to go by the turnover of every state find out whether the uh, the turnover exceeds 2 crores if it does you need to audit uh, you need to get the audit accounts audited and of course here when you look at the definition of turnover in the state it includes all taxable supplies as well as exempt or non taxable supplies so all of this will form your part of your turnover in the state in order to determine your liability for getting the uh, getting, getting the books audited the format has not been prescribed so we will look at two formats we have the uh, format which has been recommended by the institute of chartered accountants of india we have the format which has also been recommended by our society the bombay chartered accountants society and therefore there are some nuances in both these formats so we'll also quickly look at those and there are some interesting things which will come out from those uh, from these formats as well, as well so far as the submission is concerned as i mentioned the law says you have to submit all of these three things together the annual return the audit report as well as the reconciliation and of course the reconciliation and the audit report are going to be certified by the chartered accountant or the cost accountant and therefore the first question which comes to my mind is what is the government looking at when they are going to look at the audit what do they want the auditors to do and to my mind i think as a normal audit function they will really want us to say whether the books of accounts and the uh, related records are being properly maintained are we maintaining your books of accounts are we maintaining the gst records are these in accordance with the provisions of law they want us to look at whether the annual return reflects all the transactions do our returns have all the transactions of outward supply inward supply have we discharged our liability for payment of taxes any adjustments made any amendments made have these been correctly made adjustments may be on account of rectifications debit notes credit notes or may be amendments made in the data which have been uploaded in the return are these in accordance with the provisions of the law and therefore this is going to be the focus of the audit all inclusions and exclusions in the value of supply are appropriate the valuation is according to the provisions of law law and obviously they will want to know that if you are going to audit have you paid your right taxes so that is again would be an expectation from an audit or we will expect the government to want the auditors to look into if there are any exemptions or benefits have you claimed those exemptions or benefits have the conditions been complied with therefore that will be a focus which the auditor will be asked to look at and about of course the claim of input tax credit have you claimed the right input tax credits did you make your reverses appropriately did you make your adjustments for your in, in, to input tax credits appropriately adjustments being in the case of this, uh, any goods getting destroyed any uh, write offs of the uh, of the stock of goods being undertaken and therefore there are certain adjustments required to be made under the gst law and whether this is correctly made or not classification will be another very important point or should be another important point which the government will will be looking at have you appropriately classified your outward supplies the rate of tax the nature of the transactions the nature of the tax to be applied whether it's a cgst and sgst or an igst of course it's not very easy it requires a lot of information to be able to certify or confirm that this has been correctly done by the uh, by the assessee and of course finally whether the tax liability has been correctly been discharged by the audit so i think on an overall basis in any audit we'll expect that this should be the focus or the expectations from an auditor but when we really go into the audits you'll say what are the different kinds of audit we look at generally when we look at the audit i'm going a little bit into to this cuz we don't have the format so what is the expectation we generally see two kinds of audit audit reports one which asks the auditor to express his view whether the accounts and the uh, and the uh, 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 and the computations are true and fair or the accounts of the financial statements are true and fair or there is another uh, audit which is really asking the auditor to express his view on the true and correctness of the statements or the true and correctness of the computations so it's essentially in the nature of an opinion or a certification and therefore this again really gives us a question to say would the government say as an auditor please express your view whether whatever has been done by the audit, uh, by the uh, uh, register registered person is in accordance with the provisions of law is it fair 
or does, do they want us to really express or provide a certification and certify everything which has been done perhaps to the last rupee without looking at materiality look, without looking at any uh, any uh, uh, you know variations and not only go by an opinion but a certification the second question which really comes to my mind is then when they are going to prescribe the audit report what is going to be the focus are they going to look at focus on the books of accounts are they going to focus on the law and here is a slight distinction which i want to make if they want us to focus on the books of accounts then as section 35 and section 44 say that we have to provide a reconciliation between the audited financial uh, or the audited accounts and the returns filed that means you are saying take the uh, take the uh, the audited uh, accounts take the return and just see reconcile it whether it is reconciling or not but if you are looking at the law then it really expands the universe when i go into the law you are not asking me to only reconcile that everything which is recorded in my financials has flown into my returns when i'm going to look at it from look at it from the perspective of the law you want me to see whether the valuation is right whether the time of supply has been met whether the place of supply has been correctly done whether the documents have been correctly uh, 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 raised or maintained whether the discounts have been correctly passed on and so on and so forth and that really expands the whole scope of what you're going to ask an auditor to do and that's why i started in the beginning to say what is my law requiring us to do it says annual return audit and a reconciliation between your accounts and your returns now if i end up prescribing a format which is going to say go into the law and tell me whether the time of supply the place of supply the valuation debit notes discounts are correctly done or not will that be what the law is prescribing or am i having asking the auditor to do a little more than what is really allowed by the law or provided under the law so that is obviously going to be there on the minds of the center, of the center when they are going to finally prescribe the law but we have to wait and watch what really comes our way and of course depending upon both of these this focus we are going to really then decide what is going to be the approach for the audit and what is how you are going to really undertake the audit what we are going to ask the uh, our clients to prepare before we can commence the audit and with this if we can quickly jump into the audit report formats now there are two formats and i'm just going to place them side by side to say what these are all about let's look at the institute format first they sent it to the government first so i'll go with that first the institute format again is asking for a certification of the liability it is asking for a true and correct view it's not a true and fair view so that is one thing which is very clear is asking for the auditor to certify and what are they asking the auditor to do the uh, institute format has split the whole audit report into two parts form 9c and form 9d form 9c is the audit report form 9d is a statement of particulars and i'll explain what they are really asking the uh, what are the what are the what are the contents of that in form 9c it starts with an audit report there are lots of averments and we'll go into those in a little uh, in detail in, in a little while and there are eight different annexures they are asking for various reconciliations they are asking for tax computations input tax credit claims and the differential liability to be computed and an advice to be given to an assessee to say please pay so much extra tax with interest or please claim so much refund so it goes to a certification of the liability advice in a way direction because the minute i have advised or an auditor has advised the the authorities are obviously going to simply say why have you not paid your taxes then there is form 9d which is the statement of particulars which really goes into the law and we'll again go in, into a little more detail on this in a little while it's has 24 different annexures so we have eight annexures in form 9c we have 24 annexures in 9d those 24 annexures are really exception reporting so there are a host of questions which need to be addressed all of the provisions of the law and virtually every conceivable section has been put into that uh, into that annexure or in that form and then wherever there is an exception wherever you say no everything is not okay then you need to give a list of each and every transaction which is not according to the provisions of the law so while you might be able to do that for a, a business which is say about 5 crores in turnover i don't know how you'll do this which is uh, for a business which is 500 crores or 5000 crores in turnover but that's the expectations from the auditor so it looks at compliances of all the provisions of the law report discrepancies and reporting goes to the extent of reporting even proceedings which has been initiated orders which have been issued uh, uh, whether you have discharged the liability whether you have paid the taxes whether you have appeal 
all of those also are are expected on the other hand when we went and met as part of bcas our society made a slightly different recommendation we said let's go with what apparently is being stated in the section which says i need to provide a reconciliation so let the auditor give a reconciliation and therefore we said we have also gone by the same uh, the or the bcas has also gone by the, by the same philosophy of a true and correct uh, uh, certification but only you are going to the extent of the certification to say between my returns and my financials here we have given there are three uh, uh, exhibits in the format uh, given there are three exhibits so to speak there'll be annexures the first and this is a very unique way of doing the audit the first which is exhibit 1 is a pan india reconciliation so what this format suggests that you go by your total turnover as per your financials and you do your adjustments and come to your uh, turnover as per your gst uh, uh, gst uh, books that is on a all india level without segregating at a state level so you say i my total uh, turnover as per my financials is 1000 crores i make my adjustments pluses and minuses and you might come up to say 980 crores which is my amount taxable under the gst law and here you are not classifying between maharashtra and gujarat and goa and all those states thereafter you have to give a break up which says the 980 crores as per my uh, uh, returns filed in all the states where i am registered what is the total of that so you will say my returns uh, total uh, turnover filed as per the returns in all the states is say also coming to 900 crores so there is no differential liability and therefore that takes care of a pan india reconciliation you are not required to do a state wise reconciliation but yes there is a requirement for presenting state wise information as well then there is a exhibit 2 exhibit 2 says that now you go into a state wise state wise analysis you take your output tax liability as per your gst returns and now you reconcile it uh, uh, no, sorry you take your output tax liability as per your audited numbers and you reconcile it to the taxable turnover as per your gst returns obviously there are very uh, pluses and uh, minuses to be made for example there are some uh, transactions which are not taxable some which are exempt uh, and all of those will give you some uh, reconciliation uh, issues which will bring you to the taxable turnover so there is an exhibit 2 uh, which talks about the output liability there are once you have determined your taxable turnover determine your tax liability compare that with the taxes already paid in the state which will give you the differential tax liability so it's a more i would say a more compact form it doesn't need you to do a reconciliation on a state to state basis it only asks you for one reconciliation as compared to that in the institute uh, format what we really find or the expectation is what we really find or the expectation is that every assessee is going to have a trial balance uh, or his financial statements at a state level which is really practically not going to happen so i think to that extent the uh, the bcas format recognizes that that you will not going to get a trial balances at a state level you are only going to get a global trial balance for the country as a whole and that's where you start with there's a separate annexure uh, uh, sorry exhibit 3 which talks about the input tax credit again it asks various information on the input tax credit whether ta tax has been uh, sorry uh, taxes have been uh, expenses have been recorded not recorded claimed itc reversed uh, the computation of the reversals and then bring to the eligible input tax credit which is required to be taken compare that with the input tax credit already taken the difference is obviously the tax payable or the or the tax refundable of course we do not have in that format a consolidation which says from your exhibit 2 which is your output from your itc what how do you net it off for so that's a, a simple question of mechanics which you, is a very simple format to a table required to be added and that will take care of uh, the uh, the report so both of these are going on very different philosophies and i'm not really advocating which one is good or which one is uh, easier but uh, only to highlight what it is really looking at let's maybe spend a little time looking at the institute format what does the institute format really say and as i said the main format is looking at eight different annexures it starts with an audit report an audit report which is effectively a lot of averments made by the auditor a lot of confirmations given by the auditor i have received all the information and documents required for the purpose of the audit i confirm that all the transactions of output supply input supply have been recorded in the returns and reported in the returns all the deductions are correct all the input tax credit claim is correct the rates at which the tax has been paid is uh, appropriate exemptions claim have been correct effectively the auditor is certifying according to the institute format that everything done uh, in the return everything done in the returns is according to the provisions of the law so i think that's a huge ask from the auditor then it says you go to certain annexures annexure a is an uh, annexure for outward supply 
it starts with your financials and reconciles to your returns your operating income other income which is the two income and then you do your additions and subtractions to arrive at your turnover as per your gst returns then once that uh, that reconciliation is done it takes you to an extra b which talks about an outward supply uh, sorry output tax liability once you have determined your taxable turnover then you need to apply the rates of taxes find out your uh, uh, output tax compare that with what has been done in the return to say my output tax liability is 100 crores i paid 102 crores why did i pay 2 crores extra or i paid 98 crores why did i pay 2 crores short and then you need to find out that for that 2 crores what are the reasons for those difference of 2 crores there could be 20 different reasons because why that 2 crore difference is arising and for every reason you need to split that 2 crores and give a reconciliation that these are the 20 reasons this is the amount against each of the reasons for which that difference arises so it goes into an extreme level of detail and therefore that is going to be a little challenging for the auditor to also find out identify the reasons and then basket all the differences according to those reasons for the differences then it goes to an extra an extra c which is asking for the uh, the inward supplies which are all, all expenses and inward supplies and expenses again starts from the financials all your operating expenses and your other expenses and then you make your additions and subtractions and come to your uh, your inward supplies as per gst and of course when you're talking of other expenses obviously you're going to take almost everything from your profit and loss account and add it over there subtract a few heads of expenses like salaries and interest and depreciation otherwise everything is more or less inside and then you're going to reconcile that to bring to your uh, inward supply or your turnover of inward supplies and then it goes to say what is your input tax credits uh, including reversals it talks about your reverse charge liabilities it talks about how much of the reverse charge liability you are entitled to claim a credit and then every in every form or every initial it says this is as per your reverse charge as per your or this is your input tax credit or your reverse charge as per the audit this is as per the return this is the difference what the reasons for the difference for each reasons quantify uh, uh, quantify that difference amount and that, that's the basic format or the basic uh, form which is prescribed for each of the initials it goes to the input tax credit further all reductions reversals reclaims and therefore again all of that has to be reconciled and the differences has to be given it says what are the refunds claimed refunds claimed as per the audit refund sorry refund eligible as per the audit refund claimed as per the returns and is there a difference at all and of course then says give a list of all the non taxable or non uh, non taxable outward supply why taxes are not required to be paid again reconcile that with the financials as well as your uh, uh, with your returns file and finally also give a separate statement which is an extra h for inward supplies on which itc is not availed and then again give a slightly detailed, detailed reconciliation of all of that so it really goes into quite a lot if i may just take for the sake of our discussion today and just to give you a flavor there is no way we can really go through the format i thought we'll just take maybe one or two annexures what they are asking us to do if i'll take simply and the obvious one would be you're reconciling your revenues and your expenses so if we look at an extra a and c let's look at an extra a it's asking you to go from your financials to your annual returns and if says start from your revenue from operations and other income and then make your adjustments zero rated exempt supplies non gst supplies now again that's going to be exports exempt supplies any supplies on which the recipient is required to pay uh, uh, under the reverse charge mechanism for example sponsorship so that also goes over here your uh, non gst supplies all of it has to be added over here so this is going to be a, uh, a dedu deduction from your uh, total re total revenues all your supplies under schedule 3 schedule 3 you remember are uh, supplies which are neither supplies of goods or services so each one of them and that again asks you for each of the clauses you have to give the numbers so it's not just to say schedule 3 and this is the total then you have to go for each of the clauses how much is securities how much is land how much is building and for each of those clauses that breakup has to be given what is actionable claim and the breakup needs to be given sale of capital assets advances you deduct those sorry uh, you add a sale of capital assets and advances because they are not form forming part of your revenue recoveries and incidental uh, of incidental expenses and taxes under section uh, uh, 15 into bracket 2 all those there are some inclusions and exclusions in the value of supply so then they, they said you please add to your turnover uh, these incidental expenses or incidental recoveries which are also going to be liable for tax so again that has to be added then you 
add the interest late fee or penalties for delayed payment of consideration which again might be uh, sitting somewhere in your revenue side or somewhere you might have knocked it off against your expenses your write offs and disposal of business assets without consideration again that is to be added supplies to related persons including gifts to employees supplies to employees all of that has to be added unbilled revenues of course you have to deduct which says because you might have made a provision in your financial to say this is my revenue but the time of supply is going to happen in the next year and therefore you need to deduct it because you are not required to pay tax at this point of time and says any revenue not reported in the annual return so you make an adjustment maybe a plus or a minus so you need to also uh, make an adjustment for that and of course deduct revenue in the current year's financials for which the time of supply already took place last year and that will really give us the taxable turnover as per your uh, for your gst returns and that should match with your gst returns and i have not picked up a uh, quite a few of these headings which they have asked us to make an adjustment i just picked up the more interesting ones so there are maybe another about 5 or 7 which i have left out so this is the way the whole reconciliation works is the format which has been given we need to plug in all the numbers and mind you it's going to be at a state level so if you are an auditor for a company which is having business in 20 states you are going to fill in 20 annexures not one annexure according to this format so this is the way the whole reconciliation process works similar is the reconciliation process when it comes to the uh, which is annexure c when it comes to expenses it says all your operational and other expenses and as i mentioned other expenses you are going to take into your pnl expenses so that's again going to be a little tricky weeding out each one of those pnl items which have to be added for the purpose of your uh, uh, turnover for the purpose of your uh, financials to begin with and then of course you're going to deduct your non gst or exempt supplies on which there is no question of payment of tax here the intention is you start with your expenses eventually you need to arrive at the amount on which you have claimed your itc so that's why you start knocking off all the expenses on which you don't get your credit then of course supplies from composition dealers on which you don't get credit supplies on which are no which are not used in the furtherance of business so again that's uh, uh that that is what the auditor has to find out as one of my clients said i have nothing which i have used not used in the furtherance of business if you are able to do so please find out if there's anything sir <laughs> anything of that sort so it's up for our i would say ingenuity on how on how we are going to really identify these transactions going into section 175 and here for every clause of section 175 you have to give the number motor vehicles expenses on food and beverages health insurance life insurance uh your rent a cab any 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 items which are given as free samples any item which are given as gifts any any items which have been written off any items which have been disposed each of those clauses you have to give a number to say what is against each clause how much is the input tax credit which has been foregone or reversed so again it's a huge amount of uh, deduction to be made itc not available on due to incorrect gst in of the supplier so here again it's a little bit of a gray what this really meant but there is a clause which says have you foregone any itc because the supplier's gst in was not accurate now i don't know whether that is to say only on the invoice or in the gst network for example when i really try to upload that as a as part, uh, part of my 2 and the system rejected it of course t2 uh, never took uh, took off so we really don't know how that's going to really act or behave how the system will behave but uh, perhaps their intention was to say if you upload a uh, uh, an, uh, an extra transaction in your gstr2 and if the system rejects it by saying that this is not a valid tin then you need to disallow your input tax credit because you are not able to identify the supplier the supplier is not going to accept that transaction and therefore uh, these are some issues which are going to crop up from your gst network or filing of your returns itc not availed on account of point of supply being outside the state and this is going to be quite often simply very simply put hotel bills you are going to get hotel bills which are going to say your gst number is in maharashtra but he is stayed at a hotel in delhi so you'll get it into a two way but your place of supply sorry place of supply is in delhi me the minute it is in delhi you are not going to get your credit and therefore these transactions also need to be identified and you have to weed them out and report these as part of your reconciliation you add your purchases of capital goods and uh, and advances your any taxes late pay, uh, late payment uh, fees penalties which have to be included in the value of supply on the purchase side ex itc of the previous year or the next year and of course any other expenses not reported in your return so if you keep on making all these adjustments 
a massive task or a mammoth task then you really find out what is going to be your input tax credit uh, which is eligible in your return i am i'm not sure whether i'm scaring everyone but i'm not getting any reaction from you <laughs> okay you will not beat me up it's not my fault <laughs> okay thank you so and there are as i said there are about eight such format we just thought we'll take about a couple of them to just get a flavor of how how this has to be approached when you really look at you go to uh, form 9d where i said it's an exception reporting and that again by itself is a huge exercise it starts with the statement of particulars it has two part there's a two pager which you need to give the information about the business first the name the the it system which is used modification to the it system and so on and so forth so a lot of information the places of business uh, your gst numbers all over the all over the country and all of that information needs to be given and then you has part b which really starts effectively with the provisions of the of the law and then for every there are various sections in that part which talks about various clauses of the provisions for example if you look at one section levy and collection it says there are about five or six questions on levy and, levy and collection and it says whether all the supplies have been included in the return and tax has been paid or not and then it goes further to say sale transfer barter license lease so whatever are the components of the supplies in section 7 it has given a list and you need to give a individual answer to that that have this been included in the returns and taxes have been paid or not and for to respond to this there are six different sections which have been given sorry six different annexures which have been given so effectively there are six questions if you are saying yes everything has been done nothing further to be done if you say no then you go to that annexure and report every transaction which is not in accordance with the provisions of the gst law so for every question effectively barring a few for every question there is a corresponding annexure and there which needs to be filled in with all, with all the exceptions which have cropped up during the audit so if we really look at very quickly look at these uh, the whole form so 9d is concerned your first question is or first i would say block or section is on levy and collection it comprises of sec, uh, annexures annexure 1 to annexure 6 the next question or block or section is about time of supply and that's about an extra 7 to an extra 10 which is uh, uh, which is four annexures then there is place of supply one annexure value of supply again an extra 12 to an extra 17 which is six different annexures input tax credit an extra 18 to 21 returns filed which is only to summarize how many returns were filed what are the taxes paid a, a separate annexure payments made two annexures 23 and 24 and there's a host of questions have you what are the ref, uh, refunds which you have claimed how many have been accepted how many have been rejected how many are pending whether you have maintained all your documentation what is have you maintained your uh, tax invoices has the ssc maintained debit notes credit notes refund vouchers uh, 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 advance vouchers all of those vouchers have been maintained or all of those documents have been maintained delivery challans e way bills yes so all of that has to be uh, reported have you gone gone for advance ruling yes or no did you get the order yes or no did you follow the order yes or no so again that we have to answer adjudication were there any adjudications undertaken did you go into appeal was the appeal decided if the appeal was decided have you paid the money or is that outstanding even to that extent you have to give that information then there are certain ratios which have been asked for and there is one more very nice question which i like my favorite which has any other issue which the auditor wants to report i have not been able to find anything else which we can really report <laughs> and if we really look let's look at one question one part of uh, part of this if we simply look at levy and collection and what this uh, six sections comprise of the annex year one talks about whether all the different types of supplies have been included in the returns so sale barter transfer license lease disposal all of these and again they are saying against each of these you need to give the actual uh, uh, number where there is where something has not been included in the return so if you say barter is not been included in the return you need to say barter was not included this is the value of the uh, turnover on which tax has not been paid if you say a license has not been this is the value if you say a lease has not been this is the value so you have to first identify uh, during the course of the audit how many transactions have not been taxed 
then classify them into as per according to the various components of section 7 and then report it in the appropriate column so again that's a uh, information which is asked then it says whether non taxable and non gst supply which is annexure 2 have been included or not and give the turnovers so it's it again that annexure gives a long list liquor petrol diesel natural gas aviation turbine fuel high sea sales any other non taxable transactions and therefore you have to then give that break up if something was not added in the return returns and not reported in the returns schedule 3 supplies are similar for each clause of schedule 3 again they are asking that if something is not added what are the uh, what are those amounts which need to be uh, uh, you know which need to be reported schedule annexure 4 sorry talks about mixed and composite supplies here it goes into quantification to say have you has the assessee correctly classified composite and mixed supplies did he treat a composite supply as a supply simplicitor did he treat a mixed supply as a composite supply and what is the difference of tax to say I, he paid so much tax but if he really treated this correctly it should have been a mixed supply he should have really paid so much tax and this is the differential tax so again that's going to be a slightly worrisome exercise for certain businesses you'll have to go into your agreements you'll have to go into your contracts you'll have to go into the method of invoicing to be able to really identify and find this out so that's a, a question uh, in an extra three uh, an extra four which needs to be filled in an extra five talks about your supplies liable for reverse charge again it talks about your reverse charge under section 93 or 94 93 is obviously your notified reverse charges 94 is from unregistered which is fortunately kept in abeyance but you still have to work out for the period from july to october and of course an extra six talks about exemptions were any exemption notifications applicable to the assessee has he complied with the conditions of those were there any exemption notifications which was, which was available to an assessee but he did not avail it for example someone says if i go take an exemption then i will end i'll have to reverse my credit so i'd rather not avail the exemption i'll forego the exemption so please report that also and then of course are there any incorrect classification of rcm payments which you have really paid tax on i'll give you a very simple example sponsorship many companies are saying i will provide a sponsorship service but i will show it as a business support or advertising and i will simply pay the tax because if i show it as sponsorship my recipient pays the taxes i lose my input tax credit so people are doing this and here is a question to say incorrect classification of rcm that means it should have been a tax payable by the recipient but the supplier paid the tax and by paying the tax he does not lose credit so they want to now tell him whatever taxes you have paid is wrong you still need to go and reverse your input tax credit so as an auditor we need to identify these transactions as well sorry okay. So that's where we began with section 35.5 says shall get his books of account audited. Now, therefore, if you really look at section 35.5, it is not saying that you have to rely on an audit done by another auditor any under any other law. You have to do your own audit. You have to do your own examination, and then identify these transactions. The bigger assignment than that is a larger assignment. So transaction audit is obviously a challenge, and it's a large it's a very difficult proposition because you're not doing it on a holistic basis what you're doing is at a transaction level so you might always have five transactions which were correctly done and the one which you have excluded in your test check is where there was a problem <laughs> you will get so ma'am they are not saying you are not required to check the bills you are most welcome to check whatever you want to identify it they want the answer and they want a true and correct view a certification from you as an auditor how you do it is their your problem if that requires you to sit in the client's office to say before you sign a check i want to audit it so be it but they want the expectation here here according to this format at least is that you're going to go to that extent to be able to identify all of it and it is this is just the beginning when you go to the other sections you'll find a lot more challenging areas so I think this is where we look at. If we look at a slightly different value of supply, and I just wanted to really explain how, how complicated it may get. Look at value of supply. 
is again spanning into about six annexures. Annexure 12 is talking about value as per value has been determined as per rule 27 to 31. Now you remember under section 15, your uh, value of supply is your transaction value, except in certain situations you have to go to the valuation rules, which is rule 27 to 31. Now here is a question which says your client went to section 27 and to 31. He applied the rules, but he incorrectly determined the value even after applying 30 years 27 to 31. So it's not and the okay, let me go to 13 first. Where value was required to determine be determined as per 27 to 31. That means the price was not the sole consideration or the recipient was a related person. So you shouldn't have gone on transaction value. You should have gone and found out uh, determined as per uh, rules 27 to 31. But he simply went and paid tax according to transaction value. So that's where you which you are going to uh, report in annexure 13. Annexure 12 is a little different, which says he went to uh, uh, the rules, but there he made a mistake in determining the valuation. So again, goes further into uh, into that uh, aspect. And here also a clear breakup on various aspects. Price was not the sole consideration. There was a transfer of business assets without consideration, related persons, distinct persons, transactions and employees, goods sent to agents. And there's a huge laundry list. And against each you have to then really comment whether this has been appropriately done or not. Annexure 14 talks about inclusions, whether all the inclusions, taxes, duties, incidental expenses uh, uh, have been uh, correctly done or not. Section 15, uh, sorry, Annexure 15 talks about discounts, pre-sales discounts, postal discounts, whether these were correctly given or not. Section 16 says whether the valuation is as per Rule 31A and uh, 32, which is uh, your uh, lottery, uh, gambling, air travel, uh, foreign exchange, life insurance, all of those special provisions, sale of uh, capital assets. And uh, Section 17 or the uh, Annexure 17 talks about your pay origin uh, compliances, whether reimbursements to pay origin have been correctly excluded or not. So I think it really takes you to a great extent of analysis required and effectively an analysis at a, at a transaction level. And let me now quickly come through to our uh, format of the society. The society format, as I already explained, it starts with the audit report. It's a very simple audit report. It says that audit has been undertaken by so-and-so statutory auditor, and we are effectively certifying the reconciliation. It has a pro place with where you're going to report your exceptions and qualifications that other than my qualifications, which are given in the body of the report itself, we are saying these are the reconciliation as per my exhibits. I explained to you earlier already, it talks about an exhibit 01, which talks about a pan-India reconciliation going from your uh, financial statements. It has a lot of additions and subtractions or adjustments to be made. Unbuilt revenues, uh, for example, advances, deemed supplies under Schedule 1, Schedule 3 transactions, valuations, sale of assets. So all of those adjustments, which are your normal adjustments, which you'll make to arrive at your taxable turnover. And then you also compare your taxable turnover on a, on a uh, pan-India basis with the returns filed for all your states or under all your GST numbers. So if you put the uh, total turnover reported in all your GST, uh, GST, uh, GST returns, the total should tally with the reconciliation. So once it tallies, then you are quite comfortable that, okay, tax have been paid. Now, yes, it doesn't really solve all problems because you might still have a situation where in totality my turnover matches to say a thousand crores each, but I may have really paid five crores tax, extra tax in Delhi and five crores short tax in Mumbai. So there the two governments might have not got the right taxes in certain situations. If you are really gone by the place of supply accurately, it doesn't matter where you pay your tax from. And of course, uh, then it says wherever there is a difference at a GST level, you will need to go to annexure 02, which is the last bullet over here. Sorry, exhibit 02. I'm confusing the words annexure and exhibits. but So exhibit 02 is again a GST, GST-wise reconciliation which is, which is required to be done. It goes from your turnover of your annual return and goes to your taxable supplies. Again, the adjustments are going to say, this is my annual return turnover. You exclude all the non-taxable transactions. It brings you to a number which is to think this is the amount on which you have to pay your taxes. Then you go on, it goes on to say, let the auditor compute the output tax liability which is required to be given in that state. Compare that with the taxes already paid and what is your differential tax liability. So it's really, it's a simplistic form which sim goes at a very high level and just gives you the numbers, goes to your computation and then says, how much taxes have you have you paid? You might have paid that through cash or through credit, that doesn't matter. And the last is of course your reconciliation of your input tax credit with your books of accounts to your returns. And of course, 
make your adjustments for your for your you know tran 1 credits which have been uh, addition to your expenses credits claimed for the previous year claimed in the current year expenses of the current year where credit is claimed in the next year so those adjustments are obviously required to be made and it brings you to your itc which is eligible you have to then compute your ineligible itc and reversals your adjustments for rule uh, rule 37 your uh, isd adjustments your ratio your uh, reversals on account of capital assets all of those adjustments which are required to be made and that brings you to your differential oh, sorry your eligible itc compare that with what has been done in the return that gives you the differential tax liability or on account on account of itt itc so i think that is in a way i would say a simpler form to work with but uh, uh, might as sunil also meant, uh, said might have its own drawbacks also may not give that level of detail and uh, information which uh, maybe the government may be looking for but from the perspective it still gives you a comfort to say yes broadly i i would say more or less tax have been paid and you may not find too much of a gap if this audit uh, audit report is uh, adopted i think that was just to give you a a, a, a brief back uh, background on you know what is the extent of the audit the scope the coverage let's maybe spend a little bit of time on the challenges which you're going to find now when you're really really going to go into your uh, uh, audit we're going to find some challenges which we are going to come through first is the exhaustive scope and depending upon what format is finally picked up by the government and that is really going to really de uh, determine the extent of the audit required how much time we are going to take if are they going to really ask us to go for every clause in the law the way the institute has recommended in which case it's going to be the su the supplies valuation place of supply time of supply and all those aspects need to be considered it's going to be time sensitive because now they have just release the annual return yesterday if they are going to release the annual uh, return in this month and we are expecting the audit report also to be released in the current month so then we have three months four three months to go october november and december practically i think that's an extremely challenging task so in many cases I, i'm sure we have already started the audits on whatever basis but at least the preparatory work has commenced multiple reconciliations is going to be a challenge for the first year because here we have a challenge to say a reconciliation between your overall financials and your returns and we have a, we had an extra return in this year which was the 3b so now we have a financials gstr1 and gstr3b and most of the times we find that gstr1 and 3b is not matching at all so <laughs> that's the third layer of reconciliation which is coming uh, coming through and then what has been uploaded into the portal that needs to be looked at right inside of course the multiple audits first year we had the split period three months you still need to go to the vat uh, uh, regime nine months you have the gst regime now you want to reconcile this with the financials so how are you going to reconcile that with the financials because their difference may lie anywhere on a uh, on an annual basis so again that's going to take that extra reconciliation to be made and of course in the first year we are all going to spend a lot of time validating what has been implemented we have already implemented gst we have taken positions clarifications have come later on you did something on the 1st of july something came in october so have you done that right you changed the positions during the year as well and basis that lot of churning is going to happen to say you update your position documents you update your interpretation documents and then say whether this has been appropriately appropriately done or not there will be a wait audit for 3 months yes depends different states different uh, different states are prescribing some states are saying turn uh, uh, sorry prorated some states have prescribed a separate turnover for the current year i think 25 lakhs they said yeah 25 lakhs if i look at some other areas which we might really find challenging the biggest problem we are going to face is transactions which are not in the financials barters schedule 1 transactions without considerations you are not going to find anything in the financials mind you for some of these transactions you are going to go to the stock records to find out whether there is a transaction which requires an adjustment destruction of stock write off of stocks something given away as free all of that is going to come from your stock records your barters are going to come from your advertising contracts and therefore for example if it's an advertising related barter you're going to get from your advertising contracts so these kind of you'll have to be on a lookout for these kind of aspects to be able to identify these transactions valuation what are your inclusions and exclusions you're charging something say packing charges freight you are actually when you are recovering this you are crediting an crediting an expense account so you need to identify the ex, uh, the credit side of your, all your expense account and find out how much that needs to be added to the turnover so again that's going to be an exercise which is 
slightly beyond the law it's not very sorry beyond the books not clearly evident from your financials you need to go into a line item to be able to identify that transactions with related persons your first big problem plotting your related persons sometimes you have so many related parties and it's talking about 25% direct control indirect control how far do you go when you determine related persons level 1 level 2 subsidiary of a subsidiary or do i only stop at level 1 as a subsidiary so again that's becoming a problem in many cases you it's coming back because you're saying i'm holding shares in entity a then in entity b and then that entity p is holding back shares in me so again how do i really determine it's a it's a related person or not do i go down to level 2 1 2 5 whatever it may be but that's again a challenge we did face this challenge when we really had to implement this whole aspect about valuation and related persons so again that's a problem the so next is of course the biggest challenge transactions with employees or supplies to employees what do you mean by supplies to employees we started with confusion we are still in confusion at least i am we somewhere said that uh, any supplies as part of ctc is not taxable then some, somebody said in uh, september of 2017 in an faq any fringe benefit to an employee is taxable now if you're charging something what do you do if you're not charging at all what do you do so again that's going to be a call to be taken how do you really want to treat all of this where do you want to really identify we did go across in one company where we identified approximately 60 or 60 or 70 different I would say amenities or facilities which an employee is uh, entitled to. Now, how many of these are really supplies? For example, a gym or a cafeteria, is it a supply? And the question was that, do I treat my cafeteria as a supply made to an employee? Just allowing him to have lunch peacefully for 30 minutes, is it a supply? So again, that's a list to be prepared. Identify how do you want to interpret this? Adjustments, reversals, and uh, uh, discounts. Again, huge problems. A client will say everything is a discount. You will say, if I go by 15.3, what is the discount? What is the reversal? What is a waiver? What is a write-off? And you are going to have a lot of deliberations and arguments with the client on this. Tracking your EVA bills, dispatches, goods received, vendor payments. Now, you'll, uh, if you are going to ask to report on your time of supply, then your question will be, I raised an invoice my goods went two days earlier or my goods went two days later what do i do with it i raise an invoice on 31st but my goods went on the third my time of supply for goods is at the time of removal when i dispatch should i add it or should i not include it in my, in my turnover similarly for my purchases it says you cannot claim input tax credit until you have received the goods or services so now as an auditor if you want to satisfy yourself you'll have to go through the purchase invoice the goods received note match that and find out that yes in this month or this year i have received the goods physically in my factory before i can claim the credit and you might be able to do that for goods how are you going to do this for services so again it's a question mark what about your vendor payment 16 2 claim the credit don't uh, uh, pay the vendor within 180 days reverse it are you going to sit with the vendor payment details or the accounts payable to say yes these are the credits now what was the date of invoice what is the date of payment and then very interestingly someone asked me a question that i have made the payment i issued the check my vendor did not clear it so after six months that check became defunct and i had to issue a new one now what do i do do i treat it as paid to the vendor or not paid to the vendor he didn't clear the check i paid so again those questions will come up we'll have to take a call then the next problem how are you going to track this because does the client have a mechanism to track reclaim of all these credits so while he's reversed it at the end of 180 days what mechanism does he have in his office to claim reclaim this when the 108 when he's actually making the payment so again those questions are coming up reverse charge problems foreign payments 60 day time limit from the date of the invoice all of these are lying in somebody's drawer and whereas and when he has to really go and process it he goes, sends it to the uh, accounts team how do you track your 180 days so effectively oh, sorry 60 days effectively only when it comes to your pay at the type of payment you go and find out the date of the invoice and then you say now i need to also pay interest on this because there's a delayed payment so again that's going to be something which you'll have to find a way to really identify these transactions from the data it's not going to be in the financials from your data and then identify these uh, i would say infringements the liability for interest or the delays frequent changes in law less said the better and of course, disparity in positions adopted by the auditee, 
I think we are going to have a lot in the first year. So I'm not going to take too much time on this. If I may just quickly run through the approach, what you really need to do. To my mind, the first thing you're going to look do is have a very clear business understanding. Let's not go to and spend too much time into the lower part. Have a very clear business understanding. As an auditor, if you're going to go into the larger audit, not a reconciliation, then you need to understand the business processes. In one case, many years ago, we have taken the effort of going to the dispatch, dispatch section in a factory, standing over there for two hours, seeing how that invoice is made, what time, what are the activities performed before uh, uh, some goods are dispatched, to be able to really understand how the whole process works or how goods received is done, what are the risk of something falling between the cracks. You know, if you need to understand all of these processes to be able to then really identify, will there be something which may get missed. Of course, then you're going to look at your, once you have a business understanding, process understanding, you're going to look at your transaction information. How does the information get captured? If I, do I have adequate sources in the IT system to be able to identify 60 day time limit, 180 day time limit, removal of the goods, receipt of the goods or services. Are these data points available at all? What are the documentation maintained? At each stage for any client, maybe goods or services, what are the documentation generated? Is that documentation enough for us as a process to certify something or enough for us to validate uh, whatever has been done by the, or the taxes which have been paid, compliance with all the provisions of the law? Then you go into transaction analysis, gather the data, and analyze the data, perform your validation checks, get exception reports, your discussion with your clients, of course, which is going to be the toughest part, solving your queries. Once you validate all your transactions, you're going to get into solving your queries, your discussions, corrective actions, and of course, highlighting the gaps and issuing the audit report. If I may just take two or three slides very quickly, only to look at what could be some sources of information. Forget on the right hand side your reporting requirements, some source of information. You might look, look at all customer related information, like customer masters may be relevant in certain cases. You might have to look at those. Your related parties, your HSN codes, your rates, all of that is important. Your GLs, your supply ledgers are important. Contracts and agreements are obviously there. Your GSTR ones and on your audit report is obviously going to be there. Your again on your ITC side, you're looking, you're going to look at your GL accounts because GL accounts because of your expenses. Your inward registers, your goods received notes, your ITC ledgers, your information on vendors. Again, that's going to be a little bit of a problem because vendor data is not validated yet in the GST network. So in the absence of that validation, how do you rely whether the, he is going to upload the uh, uh, transactions, not upload the transactions because 2A is not final. So anyone can today even now argue that I should, according to the law, have an opportunity to report a transaction not reported by my vendor in my 2. You activate that, only then my uh, credit can be, can be denied. Until then, it's all provisional credit. I'm entitled to the credit and therefore there cannot be a reversal required today. How are you going to deal with that? Or even for the credits rightly claimed, are there any gaps if they are not available in your two-way? So again, that's to be determined. And of course, your ISD credits to be looked at. If I look at a slightly different situation of a job work, your data and your registers for job work, again, job work information, it's all available in your stock records, not available in financials. So you're going to look at your job work register, which is maintained by many companies. You're going to look at your ITC 04, which is your job work uh, uh, re return, which you're going to file. You're going to look at on the right hand side, your dispatches, receipts, uh, whether I received within one year, whether there's a, a, a infringement over there, uh, whether it's a deemed supply to be able to then look at the job work. Similar for our input service distributor, you're going to look at your procurements and the distribution, the ratios, the documentation maintained, and of course the invoicing which is done. I think that really brings us to the just the last part. What do we want our clients to do? Very simple. Do the audit and give it to us. <laughs> Don't ask for payment. Yes. So I believe in this kind of an audit. It is the responsibility of the client to prepare the audit report. It is the responsibility of the auditor to verify, satisfy himself about the accuracy and then file it. If we are going to try and fill in the audit report, if we are going to take the responsibility of reconciliation, I don't think we are going to reach anywhere. And we'll make a 
I mean, I don't think we'll do a comprehensive audit. We'll not be able to do it practically for us. So we might, there might be gaps left out. It may, may, not, may not be complete and there may be errors creeping in. So we'll have to push this on the client. We'll have to ask the client to prepare it. And that's where we need to now ask them to share, take part of the responsibility for this as well. So of course, they are going to finalize the books, ask them to designate an audit team. Who's your audit team? Because that is the team which needs to put everything to, to, together. That is the team responsible for bringing all the information, the data, the documents, prepare the reconciliations and prepare the annual report, return. So all of this has to be done by them. And of course, they need to document that, uh, significant tax uh, positions. They will have a document in the company which says, how are they paying taxes? Now, you're never going to find a problem in your primary transactions. It's your secondary transactions which are going to create a problem. Your miscellaneous transactions which are going to be a, become a problem. And therefore, you need to ask them, that have you document, documented how many miscellaneous transactions, what kind of kind of miscellaneous transactions do you have? How do you, ident how do you identify? How, what kind of documents you generate? How do you pay your taxes? So that is something which you need them to make, prepare everything, and only then you can really commence your audit. Once you commence that audit, of course, we've already seen how you're going to look at your data, how you're going to look at, look, look at registers. Then you're going to, of course, have the last discussion with them, which is understanding the results, the audit report, and what are the recommendations done by the uh, by the GST auditor? I think only in this way, this whole audit exercise is going to work. If you try and take the whole owners to say uh, the uh, uh, owners to say that we'll prepare everything, I think it's practically not going to be possible to do this audit. And the most important thing which I'd like to just also highlight is don't underestimate this audit. I have already started working with some clients. We already started doing substantial part of the work, not going into data yet, understanding processes, where we are finding that although you're spending days together, every time you dig into something, you find something more you have to look at. And then there are more questions, more information required, more documents to be verified, to be able to conclude whether there is a problem or not. If there is a problem, then you will decide whether I'll do 100% or I'll do a test check. So that's a second, I would say secondary, second level of the uh, whole analysis to be undertaken. But Therefore, this may sometimes you say, I'll finish the audit in five days. You might really take 15 days to finish the audit or maybe take, you might take much longer to do that. So you'll have to make a, a very, a, you know, considered effort uh, requires very meticulous planning before you can really decide on the, on the whole approach. And I think before I close, I just also want to highlight to everyone over here, please don't undersell yourself. We as chartered, account, we as chartered accountants sometimes don't value our services. And with the responsibility which is likely to be cast upon us, I think it's very imperative that we demand the fair share of the fees for the efforts put in. I'm not saying make super profits, make the fair share. I have seen and I've come across quotations from, from some auditors or so, uh, auditors where, which are such low fees, which I quite, I, I, I was quite amazed. They are like, between one fourth to one tenth, which should have been charged for a regular audit. So if these kind of audits, obviously we are not going to be able to do uh, these kind of fees. You're not going to be able to do a comprehensive job. And therefore you be very careful when you plan this. And while planning a very critical aspect, which you should keep in mind, you'll be able to do a wonderful job only if you take the audit for the, on a pan India basis. So if you're going to do only an audit for Maharashtra or for Goa or for Gujarat or for uh, uh, West Bengal, it's going to be much tougher to undertake this exercise. The comprehensive exercise is possible only if you do it on a pan-India basis. So try and approach this from, a, from the perspective to say for the client, you're going to handle it on a pan-India basis. That enables you to really undertake that reconciliation, that validation and that verification in either of the two formats, whether we go with the institute form or the BCS form, but then you'll have to focus on that to do it on a pan-India basis, which is much easier to complete and focus and, and, and complete the work. So I think that is another very important recommendation I want to make to everyone over here. I think I've had my fair share of time. Thank you so much for a patient hearing. We have time for uh, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, I'll request the person to raise his hand and wait for the mic so that the others who are online can hear the question. The mic will come to you, please. Somewhere at the back. 
is there likelihood uh, that government will not allow statutory auditor to conduct the gst audit i don't think so there, so of course we have no clue on this but the law doesn't say it says any chartered accountant or cost accountant so it does not debar statutory auditor it, because if they restrict then it will become even more difficult to you know other auditor to i i don't think that's going to happen because uh, you know a statutory auditor has already uh, audited all the accounts so if if somebody is having some other opinion the gst auditor if he is having some other opinion so whether he needs to go against the uh, statutory auditor and give his opinion in gst report and all this stuffs will come in i think it's a completely different ball game the statutory audit and the gst audit has nothing to do with each other except the totals so <laughs> you might have transactions outside the country which are also being audited by the statutory auditors with the gst auditor will not, will not touch for example and therefore it's very different however however i understand that you might know as a statutory auditor you'll know the system is better you'll know the process is better so you might expedite your audit Correct. but as of now to your question there is no move or we are not hearing anything to say that statutory auditors cannot do this audit okay thank you hello sir we are in process i am talking about a medium scale uh, uh, audit uh, we are in process of finalizing the tax audit and finalizing and all probabilities will be the gst auditor so at while finalizing and closing the accounts uh, what precaution you feel we should take uh, in anticipation of the gst audit so, sorry you are the auditor right I'm talking about the medium scale audit. Audit. You're the auditor. Okay. So, I think again, uh, it's very different. Uh, very different areas of, uh, I would say, uh, focus. As a transaction audit, the information which is going to be required is going to be quite different. But yes, if you are able to ensure that at least at this stage your reports which are coming out have the appropriate information to enable that re same report to be used by your gst auditors it will be useful for example make sure in your revenue data your hsn codes are getting printed your rates of taxes are getting printed instead of just printing the values then those reports will really be handy because you have already totaled the uh, tallied the totals with your financials and therefore for a gst auditor to use that data may be much easier to work on so if you have the appropriate columns and information plugged in then it will be faster So, Parin, this is the digital age. Would you want to spend a minute or two on how the GST auditor can leverage the information and dashboard that the GST and itself generates for each uh, taxpayer? Maybe you can spend a minute or two. Sunil, so, I have limited information on how the dashboards are coming through, but yes. I think uh, when you're really going to plan the audit, what is going to be your data point? And that was the first question when we started looking at the audit. Am I simply going to take the data from the from the uh, 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 the assessee or the client and then start working on it? Well, I believe as Sunil Bhai rightly said, a lot of information is coming through the GST network, and that is the information you you need to take as a starting point. For example, on your revenue side, you will take the GST R1, which has already been filed by the uh, client. and that is the information you need to then capture so instead of simply relying on the information from coming from the it system download the gst r1 and then convert that into excel use it as a starting point try and now tally that back with your financials and see whether it matches if you have an appropriate it tool then you may also then be able to match that with the accounts or your ledgers to say okay each and every transaction which is appearing in gst gst r1 has flowed into the ledger and then you will be able to satisfy that all the transactions have been captured of course that will take care of primary transactions there may be a lot of secondary transactions which are obviously going to be looked upon separately you're going to have transactions in gst r1 which is going to be for stock transfers as well which is not there in the financials so that you can obviously ta uh, take uh, separately similarly for your uh, 2a where you are at least as of now the starting point is to download your 2a and then say 
well your vendors have reported an x number how much credit have you claimed and whether where, what are the different areas of uh, uh, differences and that's where i think the immediate information available on gstr2 will be perhaps useful to us i don't think a lot of other information is available so far so that may take a little time before we are able to download that for example the details of the eva bills which were generated and i think the last time i inquired you are not able to identify or you know uh, uh, have a report which says how many eva bills were generated by some vendors where you are a recipient of the goods or services uh, of the goods sorry so if you have that report again you are going to be able to use it to say according to the eva bills you should have got 600 consignments inside you have only 400 consignments uh, in your grn or in your purchases what happened to the 200 so i think that's going to be extra data points which you will get from the gst network to be able to audit somewhere sir we are getting into investigation <laughs> but <laughs> yes we will be able to use it at some point in time whether the institute or bcas has recommended to the government to suggest that there has to be a computer assisted audit program for these audits and therefore a proper time has to be made available because this can't be done manually right nobody can do it and look at the size of companies like reliance or aditya birla group or tata group where there will be millions of transactions so has that thought been put to the government and therefore a need to defer the audit as far as the first year is concerned let the annual return go as it is but the audit can be done after 6 months doesn't matter so i think that is critical because yeah. in excise if the department itself devised a cap yes yeah. that there will be a computer why can't as chartered accountants we ourselves then tell the government yes this has to be done through a software so yes there is uh, this is a very important point and let me take it up because uh, i was uh, a part of the representation group and uh, the thought process right now was to actually look at something which is simpler and which is what parin could really bring out in the overall matrix we have right now not talked about the dates because we felt it is a little bit premature once the format is frozen we also understand that the gstn because ultimately this report will have to go online only and therefore the gstn will also have a lead time to develop the system for it and test it and then put it live and therefore we feel that to some extent this deferment will be sponsored by the government itself but as and when the format is finalized and things move ahead we will take a call at that point of time rather than start with a thought process of deferment so right now we have kept it in two phases rather than a single phase of discussion only thing is if we wait if we wait for the government to talk about deferment we are scaring the clients number one and we are scaring the chartered accountant community that start the audit start the audit the time is approaching and every all the efforts will then go waste no it's uh, see the question is because the if timeline the, if right? the format itself changes significantly of, of both these or both are scrapped by the government but it comes out with a third format then what does one do yes so there are uh, uncertainties which do exist but as a policy whether we want to really uh, jump the gun and say that we want to look at a uh, deferment is something which we were not very comfortable with right now we said let us first look at the problem in terms of simplification and then look at once that is out because till that time talking about any date according to us felt was a little bit premature sir in terms of deferment and uh, you know gst and readiness for the format what if if they accept the report in xml format the way they accept our uh, tax audit report and transfer pricing so they don't have to do much work and second thing is that uh, this date of 31st december being coded in the law so what are the options for the government to defer it even if they want to sponsor it i don't think there's a difficulty in uh, deferring a date uh, they would try to do many things by way of removal of difficulty order including removing the advance uh, tax on advances on goods or 94 itself. Uh, itself so there are many things which they could do so i'm i think that's the least of our worries that if they want to do it how will they do it they'll find a way to do it Uh, as far as xml is concerned again the schema and all will have to be generated uh, i think we'll have to just walk the bridge as it happens i would believe a, a last question if there's one we can take and uh, anyone has a question yes there's one over there that's the last question which will be handling
So, so my question is on the turnover required for audit. So you said that we uh, since turnover is not defined in the act, we have defined turnover in a state and aggregate turnover. So we should consider. I mean, it it seems to be more rational to consider a turnover of a state. So, but the usage of words aggregate turnover in the rules, so annual return rules, they have said that uh, a person required to audit under 35.5, if his aggregate turnover exceeds two crore, he is required to do an audit. And so, even for registration, they consider aggregate turnover registration in a state. So, so do you think it is the intention of the government to actually uh, make uh, aggregate turnover applicable for audit? Because even for registration, they consider uh, aggregate turnover. Uh, no, I, I did read that that it's talking about aggregate when it comes to the rules. But uh, I think the intention was never to get audit reports for someone who's having a turnover of 10 and 20 and 30 lakh rupees, maybe having a larger turnover in some other states. So I think that was perhaps not the intention. And that's why I, I felt that this will be the more uh, appropriate way of uh, interpreting it. I think this matter has been refer, uh, referred to the policy wing as well for clarification because of the dichotomy between the act and the rules. But uh, let's see what they are going to clarify. Otherwise, I will still go by that state level turnover. Thank you. Thank you, Parin. That was uh, really a very uh, interesting and a masterly analysis within the limited time which was available. The breadth of the both the formats as well as the approach towards the audit, you nicely brought out the entire niceties. You also addressed quite a few of the queries. Thank you very much. Uh, as and when the format does get finalized, We'll again disturb you and uh, request you to have one more elaborate session or maybe a workshop to really guide our members on the clause-wise analysis of the entire format as and when it comes. Uh, in the meantime, I'll request uh, the chairman of the IDTC committee to present a small uh, photograph for your uh, memory. Over to Dushant for a well-deserved vote of thanks. Good evening, members. Thank you, Sunil Bhai, for the pleasant task. Sir has, uh, Sir Parin has touched upon the approach of GST audit. He has done a nice comparison of representation by ICI and BCS, that is our society, for GST audit. He has also shown various challenges before we really start into the GST audit. Frankly, I can say just in two lines that our smartphones are really on a flight mode before the GST audit flight takes up. And in fact, we all are very ready. I mean, he has made us ready and, you know, shown us how the you know criticality of the GST audit and the season onwards, now onwards, maybe December or March, but that is the road we need to take up. And the final forms before the GST, uh, the council, you know, describes or prescribes and with this, I request all of you and propose a well-deserved, very hearty word of thanks. Thank you, sir.